Good morning, colleagues. Uh, good morning to um, all the media colleagues who have joined us today. It's been a difficult few days for people um, at WITS and for the media as well. And we thought it's important um, to engage with the media on a number of issues, including on the major issue pertaining to higher education funding and the crisis we find ourselves in yet again. Um, I won't take up much time, but I'll just welcome Professor Zeblan Velakazi. He is our Vice Chancellor and Principal of Fitz University. Um, he started um, as the Vice Chancellor and Principal in January this year, although he's been at Fitz um, since around 2012. Um, Professor Velakazi will do a short briefing with us for about five to seven minutes. And then we'd really like to allow more time for um, questions and answers from uh, the media. We have about 40 participants or so. Um, so if you could please put your questions into the chat. Uh, we will try to take live questions as well from um, the media after the five to seven minute briefing. Um, I'll hand over to Professor Velikazi now to kick off the conference and, um, and we'll take it from there. Just two housekeeping rules. Firstly, um, if everyone could just uh, mute your mics and your cameras for now while the briefing commences and we can turn them back on when it's uh, time to chat and go into the Q&A session thereafter. So over to you, Professor Velikazi. Good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Sharona and the best team and also to the press corps for making themselves uh, available at such a short notice uh, for me to uh, share with you the view of the situation that we find ourselves at, not as a university, but as a country as a whole. I've met many of you uh, on the 26th, after the 26th of June last year, when I was assuming the role of the vice chancellor, I was then designate. And uh, so, um, of course, those are different circumstances. But nowadays, what hasn't changed is that this university will go through this current challenge and emerge stronger. And we hope that the national system of higher education, which is very crucial uh, for the passing of knowledge to the next generation is managed in a sustainable and enduring manner that ensures that these institutions, this one in particular, does not only survive the next 10, 15 years, even 100 years in this next century, but beyond because universities, as I mentioned earlier, are among the most resilient institutions that face all the vicissitudes of the current times, but their stamina and their resilience to endure for uh, thousands of years. Now, the point I'm trying to illustrate this is that obviously I'm the, I guess the first vice chancellor to arrive within six weeks of being in the office, trying to clear my files, you know, landed to the crisis. Uh, I was trying to even find my way around the university. But I think uh, that presents an opportunity to rethink how we manage situations and help in crafting the national narrative around you know, the fee issue in particular and the sustainability of the academic project. I think there are three things I want to highlight then I will leave it to members of the call to ask me some questions. We are currently sitting at around 1 billion rand of student debt uh, in the university, which has doubled from 2017, uh, more than doubled rather. At the time it was at around 450 million rand. Now we are sitting at 1 billion rand. That is a debt ceiling beyond, beyond which we cannot sustain a brighter future for the, for the university. Vice chancellors come and go, students come and go, but we need to ensure that this university endures to repeat what I said earlier, that the next generation and the next generation of children who study here post our time, inherit a world-class global university that has shown itself to be in the lead of tackling the, uh, 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 some of the pandemics we faced, including this one. So it behoves the leadership of this institution to manage that in a sustainable way whilst addressing some of the issues around students. I will answer specific questions regarding the details, but for now I thought I'll just give you my high level vision of how I see this university as one of very few world-class universities of the global south that can help us tackle big issues of the day. So I think with that, uh, Chair, I'll hand over to you to address things more specifically. Oh, but before I do that, I'd like to also say that uh, I was obviously 
uh, disheartened at the level of escalation that played itself out uh, in the Bramfontein Central Business District with the uh, sad loss of a bystander who was uh, who lost his life yesterday in that uh, uh, situation. And I think my condolences go to the to the uh, bereaved. And I look forward to having a, a discussion with uh, the student representative council on how we can uh, arrive at this uh, at a solution and de-escalate the problem. Um, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, would you just want to share some information on the um, higher education funding crisis that that we're finding ourselves in? Um, uh, perhaps just uh, what's happened since 2015 and 2016 up until now, and what are possibilities for the way future, um, for the way going forward in the future? Okay, the higher education crisis, I mean, has, has been there since, uh, you know, almost decades now. And also before I answer that, you know, I want to make clear that this is not a South African problem, right? Uh, it's a global problem. If we think of student debt in the United States, the latest economic uh, numbers I picked up in the Economist magazine says that US student debt is about 2 trillion US dollars. So if you were to compare that with our GDP, you see that the debt that is, you know, almost 20 times bigger than the entire economy. So that is the national and global problem we face. Nationally, as I mentioned earlier, this is not a first crisis, it's a national crisis of sustainable funding and support for students. Uh, there have been interventions in the past, like the National Financial Aid Scheme, that really has covered some ground in supporting students that are below a particular, also whose housing, whose family incomes are below a particular level, that is below 350,000 a year, they get funded through the NESFA scheme, which the university is working with the national government or the NESFA agency to bridge where appropriate. Like this year in particular, BET uh, gave upfront funding of 300 million just to allow students who haven't received their national financial aid scheme from the government to just register with us. And that's a point I want to also emphasize as well. And uh, however, the biggest challenge we face is those that are called you know, the missing middle students who are too rich to uh, qualify and too poor to uh, afford, uh, sorry, what, and then too poor to, to, to pay, too rich to qualify for Nestlas and too poor to pay. And there's a range of those. Uh, we have systematically been working on managing that number, and that's where the large bulk of the student debt resides. Uh, on our database, just to clarify the point, we have around uh, 6,000, the range of 6,000 and 7,000 students who, to correct, are not going to be excluded, but they are part of what we consider within the basket of in risk. And that number is that is changing. It's not a number that is fixed. Among others, you've got those that actually have, you know, uh, lost their scholarship because they failed uh, repeatedly, uh, and then they don't qualify for both NESFAS and uh, their own scholarships through various companies. And others are those that all within a certain amount of money that we are working through to make sure that you draw down that number. Now, as of the end of yesterday, 95% of our students have been registered. So we have had 1,200 applications for assistance of which 750,000, uh, 750, have been registered. That's almost close to 70% of those that have been registered. And we are working on systematically uh, working for that number on a case by case basis to ensure that whilst addressing uh, that particular pressure of, 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 of students, we do not take decisions that imperil the sustainability of the university. And that to me is how at least at that uh, we can solve this problem as it manifests itself. But by and large, uh, as I've said, Said earlier that it is a national crisis. This manifestation at that is we get whatever resources we can to minimize the uh, the impact of this uh, global crisis, which has been with us uh, in particular. Show this phase in 
Thanks, VC. And then just to clarify that six to 7,000, um, the, the SLC has been putting out numbers saying six to 7,000 students um, are, are at risk of being financially excluded. Um, just to put in context that these are the six to 7,000 people who owe the university money, who, who have ever owed the university money over the last seven years. And as you explained, it's made up of, of a number of people, some who've dropped out, some uh, who were academically excluded, some who lost their bursaries and funding, and some who are uh, genuinely, um, who, who cannot um, uh, afford to, to pay their own way. Um, thanks for touching on the missing middle questions as well. Um, and then could you perhaps just um, share with the media what WITS has done? You're saying that 95% of students have registered. Um, we know that online learning is continuing this week. We've had about more than 25,000 students log on this week onto the online learning platforms. Um, and, um, and, and the academic programs going ahead in, in that regard. But we've also extended registration. Do you, could you just touch on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, first, in my last meeting I had with, with my team, with the SRC executive, we, um, <clears throat> so excuse me, I've been <clears throat> talking about this morning. Apologies. Um, the last meeting we had with the SRC, uh, which was, I think, on Tuesday, uh, was that I actually, uh, in consultation with the CFO, uh, put forward what I would call a special relief COVID fund, a once of vice chancellor's COVID relief fund of 10 million rand. And that's on top of the 17 million rand we put for the hardship as a once of noting that, you know, some uh, students and have parents who have during this last year fallen through the hard times. So that is actually our unbudgeted, uh, extraordinary relief effort that we thought would help uh, ameliorate the situation. And uh, we have extended also to allow for the numbers of students, the remaining the number of students who have not yet registered at both undergraduate and postgraduate. We've extended undergraduate enrollment to the uh, 17th of March and postgraduate to the 12th of March. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, we'll now move on to the Q&A session. Um, there is, an, um, all these statistics and facts and figures are available on the WITS website. Um, the number of students who are registered, the number of students that we assist through financial aid scholarships and bursaries, which amounts to more than a billion rand a year, the amount that WITS has committed uh, through different funds to assist students, um, and the number of students um, who have been registered. So all these facts and figures are available on the WITS website as we speak. I will post the link in the chat as well. Um, let's move directly into the, the Q&A session. I know that we've got about 45 minutes left, and I think it would be useful um, to just hear from the media directly, um, as, as is the purpose of, of this media conference. Uh, we know that the minister will be having a conference um, at 11 o'clock today, a press conference, which many of the media would want to join as well. Um, we know that they will be touching on issues related to NASPAS and financial aid scholarships and bursaries. Um, I'll start with the one question that has come through the Q&A um, session. It's from uh, Tabiso Lehoko from Sputnik News. And he says that SASCO has threatened to make institutions ungovernable. Should these protests continue and funding remains a problem, how will the university respond? Because learning has to continue. Uh, uh, Tabiso Mr. Lehoko, I think that it obviously uh, uh, following yesterday's unfortunate events due to the escalation, uh, it is the moment as South Africans, as the members of the university community, just to tone down the rhetoric and try to ensure that we uh, do not allow the situation to escalate further. I'd like to appeal to all members of the community, both within and outside the broader legal society, the national system, just to allow for the for cool heads to prevail. In a fog of conflict, if I can use that word to describe the current situation we find ourselves with, is that there is a lot of emotions and there's a fog and there's heat. I request that all of us collectively, uh, including the management of all universities, just to uh, have at least more light, less heat, because we need to arrive at some stage at finding a solution that is 
uh, lasting for the entire system, that it will obviously be dependent on uh, uh, the policymakers in the department on how they, 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 they manage and help us with the situation. The Vice Chancellor's powers are limited within the perimeter of the university and the council approved budget. Thanks, Vice Chancellor. The next question is from the Voice of Wits FM. It's Karabo Tebele. And uh, Karabo asks, why did it take the university until yesterday to respond to the students? Uh, perhaps you can elaborate on whether the university has been um, engaging with students, and if so, what were the nature of those engagements? Yes, um, I want to correct one point without, of course, turning this into a discussion about you know, the management of that said, and the, as I said, I think that would be not appropriate at this level, but I'm just gonna uh, put facts on the ground here. Is that number one, since I joined the university at the beginning of last year, or even by earliest last year, when uh, the lockdown regulations eased. I did a lot of working about on campus, trying to hear from students. Some of them were exiting SRC members and some were incoming SRC members via an in, in induction. So there's been a series of conversation on a one-to-one -one bilateral between myself and the leadership and also with members of my senior executive team. Since I joined the office at the beginning of January, uh, when I assumed the role of the VC, uh, the dean was assigned as a representative whose assignment is to look after student affairs to start a conversation and deal with some of the requests and demands that the students have made. Uh, that was followed by a team that I established of senior executive team members uh, to meet with the SRC. And I think to this day, we've met almost eight times. At the last meeting, as I repeat, that I was at last week, that's when I actually, uh, as a means of finding a solution to prevent this from happening, uh, given our limited resources, was that special 10 million rand uh, COVID fund and the extension of registration. So all these other concessions that have come along the way have been because of a result of what we can afford, what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. So we have been meeting the SRC throughout this period. And finally, on Monday, I tried to reach out uh, to the uh, Tuesday night, yeah, before this, to the SSC president to have a one on one with him and get his team to come in and meet us. And that is something that the dean, uh, we are meant to have met them yesterday, but there was this incident. And today, we are having another meeting. We are always reaching out to talk to them and find out how we can agree. And there are things that we cannot all agree on. And I think that is the reality. Okay. Thanks, VC. So following on from that, um, how Hello asks, did the university genuinely believe that the large scale deployment of heavily armed para paramilitary and police personnel was the best response as opposed to say a dialogue with students? Like did, this, did you think that the students could be beaten and shot into submission, particularly considering that this kind of protests have been occurring year after year and well, this uh, repression has never worked in solving them? So it's quite a loaded question, but basically I think the three, three points you have to, that they're asking for is, was um, the deployment of heavily armed uh, people, firstly on campus, if you could comment on that, and then did you have any say, did you have any say in the um, police and, and, and what they did yesterday? Did you ask them to, to uh, be deployed yesterday? Yes, the answer for the last one is simple. Uh, I'll, I'll answer the question in reverse order. On the police deployment, I want to put it on record that the, I wish the vice chancellor, I mean, people assume that the vice chancellor has got executive uh, policing powers. The leader of the university, members of the core, is an academic and an administrator of the university whose jurisdiction ends within the perimeter of the university, right? Anything outside of the university is public order by either JMPD or SAPS, and that is out of my control. Internally, and that is the point number one, and I just want to make that clear that even if I wished I would not have had those powers at all, and therefore the university uh, wants to make it clear that there was no call coming from the side to do that, because we don't, it's not within our mandate in any case. And we are not law enforcement officials, that is a public order uh, matter. 
internally in the university. Uh, first, I want to correct one fact that is not correct. These uh, security members are not armed, right? No one carries guns here. Uh, that is not true. And uh, secondly, with every start of the academic year, we need to ensure that we allow protests to take place on campus within parameters, within reason, uh, and allow the continuation of the academic process. And that is something that every management of this, of this university has ensured. And to this day, there haven't been any injuries on campus, as far as I can recall. They've all happened outside. So the university needs to correct that uh, misconception. Thanks. We're obviously talking about, about this year. I know we, we saw what played out I mean, in 2015 and 2016. Um, Akwana from Reuters. Just on that, uh, this year, no police were called on campus. There were no police called on campus. Yes, in 2015 and 2016, because the situation escalated within the university, the police were called. But within campus, it is just the normal, uh, you know, security of people just manning the uh, perimeter of the university to ensure that there's uh, appropriate access control and allow the registration to continue seamlessly. Okay. Um, so this year, no police was called. Okay, got it. Next one, Akona uh, Machoba from Reuters News asks, how much of the hardship fund has been used to assist students facing possible financial exclusion this year? And how much money remains in the fund? Perhaps you can elaborate both on the WITS hardship fund as well as on the WITS COVID-19 relief fund. So that would be 20 million rand in total. Yes, on the hardship fund, as I mentioned earlier when I gave the introduction, 17 million rand. Um, which was, has been allocated. And last year, we increased the number from 10 to 17 million as part of the hardship fund that is worked through by the SRC and the uh, appropriate officials in the university who look at the uh, hardship on a case by case basis. Again, this year, noting that we are in a situation that is abnormal, right? I, a special 10 million rand. Uh, 10 million rand uh, uh, once of fund was there to deal with those cases of students who have fallen through you know, the cracks because uh, of parents losing their uh, livelihood. And three, that is on top of the fact that uh, the university invests uh, something to the uh, uh, order of uh, 27,000 of the uh, 37,500 so students at VETS are on some form of scholarship, financial aid, or bursary, right? Some of it is VETS internal bursary, some of it is scholarship they got from outside, and VETS augments that. So that comes to about a billion rand that the university dedicates to this uh, management of scholarship on a year by year basis. And then we have these hardship funds that bridge the gaps where the uh, the scholarship and funding officer cannot uh, afford. And that is at the stage within the limit of what the university can sustain. Okay, so th that answers the next question, which came from um, Anastasi, which is saying the main issue here uh, was around financial exclusion in the last few days. And, um, and that is for the university to ensure that students with historical debt are allowed to register. Um, does the university have any other proposals for, to resolve this issue, um, aside from the WITS hardship fund, aside from what we're already doing? Are you willing to negotiate on a way forward? Um, do you have yes. the, yes, and also- The negotiation on a way forward is that, sorry, yeah. The negotiation are you, in a, are you in a position to do that as the university? Okay, uh, that's, that's sorry about that, Shirana, I didn't get that. Uh, as I mentioned, the university uh, can only do so much. And in, in actual fact, some of the students within the university acknowledge that, right? That they are limited resources because they are cognizant that they don't want to be the last students to study at a world-class university. They want probably their children and their grandchildren to be here. So therefore, everyone is mindful of that. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, there's a magic bullet to solve this. As I mentioned, it is a global problem. However, I think you can solve it as a society, civil society, government and the private sector to see how do we uh, uh, not go back to the situation that we found ourselves in today or yesterday and 
uh, the ones that we found ourselves. Even every year, there's been protests over this issue. We tried to patch here and there, but you've never really found a sustainable solution going forward. And I think that is a challenge. And I think as part of my uh, mandate now is to focus on that and see how we solve it. But I would be uh, a magician if I was to say that I can give you a solution for it now. That cannot solve it. It requires the higher educational sector, uh, all universities, all vice chancellors, and the uh, government to arrive at a, at a solution to this uh, student debt crisis. So BC, a follow-up question is, what would you like to see um, uh, the minister um, speak about at 11 o'clock today? Uh, I would like to, of course my job is not to prescribe to the, to the minister what to do, but I'd like to see him present a solution to this, at least give us ideas on how to present a solution. The minister sits with the budget, he sits with the cabinet, so they've got a high level overview of the national crisis. So therefore what I'd like to see, at least guidelines on how the universities can uh, manage their fee increases, uh, through government subsidy and also uh, how they can, where they possibly can, support us in terms of appropriate subsidy, which over the last year has flatlined as well. Again, the government, we are doing all these interventions against subsidy, which is uh, not growing at university from, this, from the state. So now we actually have to scrounge within diminishing resources to try to support students. And again, that is unsustainable. So I think I'd like to see the minister if I may, just give us a uh, direction of which direction, of, of, of which route to take. And I'm aware also that, of course, on their side, uh, the economy has uh, shrunk by 7%. The national coffers are also you know, not there unlimited. So uh, it's a tough question, and I've got no direct answer for that, but I think at least we need guidance as a university sector of how we can do it. And vets alone cannot solve it, so I wouldn't as a vets DC. Uh, proclaim to be able to solve this crisis. Thank you. Um, Vici, a follow-up to that was, do you think that the HERE Commission's report of findings have been sufficiently implemented um, from 2017 to date? Uh, you know, what is interesting about the HERE Commission, it was obviously uh, before my time, because that was in 2017, and the person was closer to the conversation in that regard was the previous vice chancellor and the uh, and the member, some of the members of the commission and the University of South Africa, right? And uh, that was part of my first assignment actually when I joined is to actually familiarize myself with those documents because that was the conversation taking place at VC level going to the awaiting the then presidential uh, implementation. So I wouldn't be in a position to say that this was in the recommendation, but I know that some of the recommendations of this uh, higher commission were not implemented. Okay, uh, thank you, VC. Um, we'll take the question from Msundisi from City Press. And he asks, did Vitz not foresee these protests? And how is the university now going to resolve this impasse? So similar to one you've answered before, but how, what's the solution for Vitz University going forward? You know, uh, Msundisi, I arrived again on the 1st of January, right? You're trying to find a way around the system. Uh, the first thing you do is you open up, a, open up a conversation with students and say, can you help us solve this? One of the interventions we're gonna, we're gonna do was through this sustainable uh, SRC fund, right? Uh, and to try to raise about 10, 15 million rand and so on and so forth. Those are, and then Vets uh, did put 10 million and I did put an emergency uh, fund to that to actually uh, sustain this. Uh, protest cannot be stopped, uh, but you just have to manage them that they don't escalate. Right? And therefore, uh, did I foresee protests? Maybe yes or no. Uh, I never, personally never thought that I would have a protest uh, with such high escalation so soon after my takeover. I think I'm the first VC to be greeted with a protest, but that's part of, uh, you know, uh, whilst I was still trying to find my feet, but I think uh, we'll have to just find our way around and resolve this because with this, this crisis, you need to find solutions as they present themselves. But I think to me, engagement at various level is very important. 
Okay, thanks, BC. We're moving back to yesterday's incident. Um, so we've got two or three related questions which I'll group together. Number one, has Vitz University reached out to the family of uh, the man who passed away yesterday? Number two, we've had some Vitz students who were injured. Um, are we engaging with the police and with IPED to ensure that a proper investigation will take place? And then number three, what is the current situation at the university? Uh, from within the university campus itself, for the last three days, you know, things have been proceeding uh, uh, normally, well, under the circumstances. Uh, so, uh, as I can report on that, that you know, all of these uh, events took place uh, in the Bramfontein uh, CPD, and um, the university will allow the process, the IP process, to take its course. I mean, there's a there are professionals who are dealing with that case. Uh, once we've had, yesterday, I said through trying to get as much information as I can because there was a lot of information overflow that you need to now sit down and understand the situation, and which is why I called this press conference to explain the first situation. And of course, the next week, we've actually sent out uh, messages of condolences uh, broadly uh, around this issue, and uh, and. Uh, we also have reached out to students of the university, uh, those that actually have, uh, you know, the journalists that got caught in the uh, uh, ensuing uh, confrontation uh, through the VETS uh, counseling unit and so on and so forth. We are making all our services readily available for students to receive counseling and trauma counseling and, uh, because they are deeper than even physical injuries. So that is actually our current focus at the moment. Okay. Um, the next question is from Dinesh Balia and um, Dinesh looks after uh, many of the student publications on campus. And she asks, is there a move at USAF um, level to ask for some sort of state sponsored bailout for historical debt? That's a very good question. Actually, I think that is something that USF can need to worry about. Whether the state will bail out or not is at a different level. And that is something that, you know, and I've not yet had time or left to take and engage um, with, the, uh, with USF on that and uh, see whether we can. That's one of the options that we could, we could, we could look into. Or really look, at, look deeply into uh, the implementations of some of the recommendations that came from some of the studies that were done, you know, and see whether we can, and take a step back and say, how do we uh, correct or re uh, re rethink uh, the, um, rethink the, uh, the, 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 the implementation of 2017 that is more sustainable. Clearly we've reached a ceiling now. So that, that will require a dialogue. Maybe that the bailout could be one of the many uh, solutions, but it's not the one size fits fit all. That you can say bail out, then you solve the issues. You've seen that bailouts don't work sometimes. So it's a question of how do we, um, as USAF, as the higher educational departments and treasury, work out the process of what can be implemented that is sustainable beyond just bailouts. Uh, the next question is from Edwin Naidu, and he asks, "What is your solution to eradicate this one billion rand student debt?" and to ensure that there's no recurrence of protests and loss of life and injuries. And more importantly, what is Witz's take on the unnecessary SAPS violence? Um, was anyone at, uh, at threat to call for such ex action? Uh, you may have answered that. And um, Edwin, the VC has indicated that Witz did not call the police onto campus um, yesterday or had, does not have the power to do so as well. Um, so VC, if you could answer that question. Um, what's the solution to eradicating the one billion rand student debt and ensuring that there are no recurrence of protests? And then secondly, what's your take on the unnecessary SAPS violence? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think the one on SAPS violence has been answered, uh, Edwin, that actually uh, it's a public order matter. And I, we were concerned and I think it's regrettable that uh, the, someone died because of what I would call uh, you know, uh, disproportionate uh, uh, use 
use of containing the uh, protest. And I'm not saying this as someone who's an expert on right control. And I think that uh, the situation could have been resolved better. Um, but on the, I did answer that one on, on calling the police. So I think uh, that was addressed earlier. On the um, issue around uh, how do you stop future protests? Protest adverts have been there since the 1970s. Part of the vest culture, that's what actually we have, is, you know, uh, there are many issues uh, that will galvanize the student movement to protest over. Fees is one of them. Could be others as well. You know, matters around social justice, which will, you know, which young people need to raise up as issues. Could be climate justice. There are many other things that are a cause for, 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 for protest. So therefore, uh, you, one would not be running a university of free thought if you, don't, if you don't allow protest, because if you suppress protest, then you are actually, you know, not stifling. But so what kind of protest? Protest must be there, but must also be called to the fact that you cannot uh, escalate to the level of violence. There's a protest and there's disruption. So those are the two things where you need to draw a line. Uh, peaceful protest, yes, but disruptions uh, that will not, uh, that will not, uh, uh, be comfortable to dealing with. Uh, the one billion rent debt. First is uh, you need to arrest the debt. When debt has doubled in four years time, then we are, we, are, we, are, we are reaching a fiscal cliff, right? And you must actually just arrest the debt, which is why actually we said we cannot go beyond this point. Uh, we are starting a centennial campaign next year. Right? There won't be any bailouts. We are starting a centennial campaign next year, which will help us at least have enough resources to fund all other university programs because the student debt issue is just one of them. I mean, you need to do research that ensures that you are able to respond appro appropriately with things like COVID. So if you, are, if you have actually taken money from one research port, South Africa will never have coped at least at a level of policy advice uh, at the level of vaccine development with COVID. And VETS was the university that actually was at the center of driving this project. So one actually has to be careful that, you know, you cannot solve uh, student debt just like that and compromise uh, some of the core functions of the university that are of national and continental importance. At the moment, uh, Edwin, let's just arrest the situation. Debt will always be there. You cannot remove debt, but just control it and try to you know, systematically work at reducing it very slowly. First, number one, good arrest. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. So um, it's changing tack slightly. We've got about three questions from Akona, from uh, Mbumzi, and Nsundisi uh, around the academic program. So when did the academic program commence? Um, is it ongoing? Have there been any disruptions to the academic program? And do you anticipate if there'll be any future possible disruptions to the academic program? Uh, since Monday, the academic program has continued and um, about 25,000 students uh, logged on to a new online program, uh, Canvas Ulas program, and that has been running since Monday. Uh, and some students, of course, uh, because of their conditions at home or cannot access data, uh, or are far away from home, the home conditions don't allow our own campus in races as part of ensuring that we don't, you know, we do not uh, allow this digital divide to create internal inequalities. Uh, so the academic program is continuing. Um, at the same time, obviously, we have kept communication lines open. We're meeting with the SRC, the duly recognized student body in the country, and the university by law to engage with them further. So actually, we are seriously taking this discussion seriously uh, once they, you know, uh, at the, during the course of the day, the dean is working with them to arrange a meeting between the senior executive team and the executive of the SRC. Uh, thanks, VC. Um, a question here, you spoke about uh, the digital divide and divides among students and inequalities. Um, has the university provided uh, laptops, devices, data um, for students who require them? And if so, um, have those already been dispersed to these students? Uh, you recall that last year when, um, especially about, about this time last year, uh, when our normal educational activities were disrupted by the, uh, you know, by the uh, spread of COVID and then the universities had to be decanted. 
we were able to pivot towards online learning, but we realized that about uh, 5,000 students within our university, uh, when they went home, they never had devices. Uh, not they have data that we, you know, those that live in homes with Wi-Fi can access. We provided uh, through zero, zero, through zero uh, base rating with the uh, MNOs, uh, the tech companies for zero rating at 20 plus 10 gigabytes, right? That is uh, the data that the students have. And this year we've also arrived at the same, more or less the same arrangement as well. We provided devices to those in form of a pool, a loan pool, uh, three to 5,000 devices that are part of now our pool that we sourced from uh, the, 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 the sector. And that was also part of our intervention and then uh, data and loading of software that will allow the academic uh, program to continue to ensure that even those that do not have the appropriate um, uh, facilities working remotely can access with the same level of you know, uh, 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 access as those that come from families that can afford. And in extreme cases, despite COVID, we ensured that we bring some of the students onto campus whose home conditions just don't allow for them to meaningfully uh, benefit from this uh, online learning. Um, a question on student engagement. So you've said that you've had meetings with the SRC. However, many other organizations have also submitted demands to the university. Why has the uni university not responded to all the groups who have submitted demands? Um, as far as I can interpret the, uh, the statutes of the university, right? You can talk, as I mentioned, you can talk uh, to other student formations, but you, know, you have to have one formal structure. There's one executive management of the university. There's a recognized labor at university in various forms. And there's also a recognized structure that is enshrined in the High University Act, and that is the SSC, right? Demands can come, the dean uh, does receive those demands, but we, res we respond to them in a way that actually ensures that it is aligned with the structures of the university. I think that is something that is, uh, we cannot compromise on that to ensure that you've got appropriate governance in place. There is a democratically elected SRC. I might disagree with them, but they are a structure that I will engage with on this. There are student societies that uh, deal with other issues other than this, like, you know, surfing society, chess society. Yes, we do meet them as part of the broader uh, CSO clubs and society engagement. Um, thanks, BC. Um, another question, um, do you think that, um, or do you think that the university uh, will go back to being a contact um, teaching university? Will you look at blended learning options? Um, and if so, uh, could you accept more students who can study online? That is a, uh, a question that is, everyone is asking globally as well. I mean, all times higher education and all other higher education uh, authorities are dealing with that question. What is the future of learning, teaching and learning post COVID? One thing that's for sure, we'll not do online forever. Online is not the means of uh, you know, fully online. We need to move to what I would call high flex, hybrid and flexible mode of learning. So we are now actually thinking of the future of education where we do both online and uh, physical contact, because physical contact is important to create those networks that you need for young people to learn through peer learning. So therefore, I think there are limits to the online program. So that I think to me is I see the future of learning as just something which is a mixture of both depending on the subject and depending on the course material. And I think that is the opportunity that COVID has, um, the, has presented to us to rethink what you, the way we've taught uh, over the last uh, thousand years, effectively. Uh, the, 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 the one on um, whether we will be, we are a contact university. I mean, one must not deny that fact. I mean, the correspondence university would be, you know, uh, University of South Africa. We are a contact university. However, possibly one of the means we can look into is, uh, is, 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 is 
is to increase certain online streams for those that do, for those that can not afford to come. That allows us to increase access. At the same time, we turn on around a parallel university as well, right? University of those that are vets on the ground and those that are online vets. You know, you've got to be careful here. We are one university. So therefore, the major center could dedicate many, you know, for those that cannot, cannot afford online. I think you'll be creating a two-tier system that is uh, not appropriate. Um, the last two questions that, um, um, that, uh, that I have in my list are around institutional culture at universities and higher education. How do we build a more humane institutional culture um, at universities and within the higher education sector? Um, I mean, I cannot speak for the other higher educational sector, I mean, but other VCs were in charge of that. And I think um, before this uh, unfortunate escalation, I was actually going through a uh, process of um, uh, engage, you know, of, of, of meeting staff, okay? Not meet them physically, but uh, to actually explain to the staff the vision that we have for the university. And among the, the, the key pillars of this vision is institutional culture, right? How I can create an inclusive culture that actually respects and that pushes for excellence, but at the same time respects our diversity. And that is something that will be work in progress. Uh, and I've started that conversation with all academics, all professional and administrative staff to actually think about as best 10 to 100, what is the best that you want? Uh, that I cannot say, this is a culture I can impose. Culture is grown from within the university through dialogues. And that was actually what occupied me over the last uh, uh, six weeks uh, to allow one, should I be installed as the vice chancellor, the opportunity to articulate my vision. Um, so, uh, we've got one journalist who feels that the question around IPED wasn't answered sufficiently. Will you be putting pressure on IPED to speed up the investigation um, into the matters which ha incidents which happened yesterday, um, both involving um, the students who were injured as well as uh, the, pass uh, the man who passed away? Of course, I mean, you don't want this to be a, a cold case, right? I mean, things must be done uh, by the professional that they meant to their job as, as expeditiously as possible. Uh, that is a uh, given. Thanks. And then one more question from Akona, and she says, um, the University of the Western Cape has recently taken the decision to financially clear all students to register this year. What is your view on this? And what is stopping WITS from following suit? My view in, on this is not uh, for me to judge what other universities are doing. Right, as I said, that this is a national crisis with its own uh, institutional uniqueness. As far as best can go, uh, this is where we are at. Uh, just doing something because I don't know what actually parameters or data informed the vice chancellor of UWC to uh, implement that. Maybe it's got some, you know. So I don't want to actually uh, copy paste the template that has been used elsewhere. We need to work out the template what actually works for vets and noting the versus institutional position as a global African university, what can we do in a sustainable way that at least from the best point of view, will ensure that we address student debt, which is a national problem, and also uh, ensure that the university uh, endures for generations to come. BC, so uh, a follow up to that, that's what the uh, we've got to, the last two questions here, um, which I can see we've probably got time just for the last two before people hop into the uh, minister's pre pre press briefing after this. The first is um, these protests impact on the university, they impact on, on people, they impact on the institutional culture, but they also impact on the reputation of the university. Um, do you think that this will, uh, that these kinds of protests impact on this reputation and its ranking, both in South Africa and abroad? Uh, versus ranking over the last seven years has been improving. We are undisputedly one of the leading universities on the continent uh, and also among emerging market universities which just came from the recent times higher crisis, uh, times higher crisis, uh, times higher education uh, rating, which puts us among the top 12 out of 200 nations 
uh, from Eastern Europe, Latin America, the rest of the African continent, and some parts of Asia. So, uh, and we are number 12 out of more than, you know, 40, uh, uh, say 20,000 universities in that uh, ranking uh, system. And uh, obviously, you know, if people see an element of stability in the system, it will, you know, uh, not reflect well on the academic reputation of the university, rather not on the academic reputation, on just the perception of the university. But in terms of the core work we do, research, teaching and learning, that is not compromised at all. What you just need to work on is, you know, uh, finding solutions. And I would also end on this note that that's by its position, because it is standing uh, as arguably Africa's most central premier and now clearly important university because uh, the amount of spotlight that, fo that, 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 that focuses on us are not only problems of vets, but vets is a lighthouse for all the problems that you face. And that therefore is something that I've learned over the last six weeks, that you're not only just the visual of vets, but actually what you, you know, it's actually the university that actually represents all the crises and the strength that we have as a country. And that actually comes with the position of leading such university, which is right in the media spotlight. Uh, whatever happens here, just generate the right amount of, uh, of, 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 of media attention, as it should, because of its uh, history and because of its uh, standing. And so, you know, and that is what the uh, no vice chancellor works blindly into. Thank you, uh, VC. So, um, Karaba, I'm not going to read out your question again. I think it was answered, and the VC has confirmed that um, the university will follow up with iPad, um, uh, iPad on the um, on, on the match on the incidents yesterday, and ensured that a speedy investigation um, takes place. So, the VC has answered that one. Um, VC, what's the way forward today? What's the way forward in terms of students? What are we expecting? Um, any more disruptions today? Do we think uh, we are seeing that students are mobilizing both in Johannesburg, in Bramfontein, um, and nationally, um, and, and, and online as well? Um, so what's the way forward for, for today, for VIDS? We are opening up lines for dialogue with the, uh, with the student leadership, uh, continuing and conversations. We need to work the problem. We need to you know, find solutions they will not please everybody, but at least talk through the problem and then identify where the errors lie. And also, uh, uh, you know, let people know what is the state of the numbers as I presented you the numbers, the real facts on the ground in terms of number of enrollment, the nature and scale of the problem, uh, and then deal with it uh, in a clear and concise, precise way without just throwing numbers there about. You know what numbers they are, I've shared them with you. We just need to, uh, as a university, deal with it uh, as a university. However, as I close, this is a national problem. You know, it is not the first problem. It's a national problem. Within the university, we can do whatever you can, but it is a national problem, as I've mentioned earlier. VC, are you going to be meeting with the minister anytime soon to, to talk about these issues? I've been in touch with the, uh, one of the ministers got a press conference. Uh, I've been in touch with the, uh, some of the officials in the department uh, who might have briefed about this uh, situation. But I mean, it has to be done as a collective. So through the uh, USAF, the University of South Africa, uh, we'll await guidance from Professor Bauer, who's the head of USAF, to uh, facilitate that discussion at the right time. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, and thank you to our colleagues from the media. Um, thanks for joining us. I know that there are still, still a few unanswered questions. We're happy to take those offline. And um, the Vice Chancellor has agreed to make himself available uh, for interviews um, over the next day or so, if required to talk about the higher education financial crisis. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, rec uh, this recording will be made available together with all the stats and facts on the WITS website uh, within the next hour or so. Okay. Thank you and take care. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your, for your time.